Hello and welcome to lesson 10 of an inspector course. Our title today is significance of the inspector. So we're going to be focusing on Inspector Ghoul mainly today and kind of different interpretations of what his character represents. Um, before we get into the nitty gritty though, what I would like you to do is copy down the quotation, which is kind of on the middle of the screen. So it's the lighting is pink and intimate until the inspector arrives when it becomes brighter and harder. Um, and this is a stage direction from the very, very beginning of the play. And I would like you to explain in your own words, using sentences in as much detail as possible, um, to explain why you think Priestley wants to change the lighting. So looking at why, for instance, it's going to be pink, why it's going to be intimate before the inspector arrives, and then considering why it changes to being brighter and harder. What does that um, symbolise in terms of the inspector's character? So pause the video now and just jot down some ideas. OK, so when we are looking at the inspector's character, it's important to kind of take on board a potential genre that the play belongs to, and that's expressionist drama. Um, and this was a dramatic movement in the early part of the 20th century. So kind of around the time when the play was set, basically. And what um, Expressionist drama aimed to do was to focus on the spiritual awakening of the protagonist. So the main characters were supposed to undergo some sort of change where they realised some ideas or changed some sort of beliefs that they had. Um, and in order for this to happen, it wasn't meant to be kind of realistic, but kind of things would symbolise certain things um, instead of kind of trying to make sense and just being kind of um, an everyday story things would take on a sim symbolic role to really allow that protagonist's journey to continue um, and they often dramatized struggle against upper and middle class values so bearing in mind how rigid the class structure was at that time there were really strict rules in place for how people were expected to behave and how they were expected to live their lives and a lot of these plays were written by people who were fighting against that rigid structure um, just because it wasn't particularly conductive to being creative or being an individual. Um, and Inspector's Gould character is meant to be considered for the meaning he creates in the play. So he isn't a realistic police inspector, um, but he does create a lot of meaning within the play and he does serve a purpose within the play. And that is largely a symbolic one and this can be quite a confusing concept for students to kind of wrap their heads around because he is presented as a police inspector um, and part of Priestley's message here is that you kind of we only really respect him because he comes with this um, potential threat of the Burlings being arrested basically um, if it was just an ordinary guy off the street who represented um, socialism you probably wouldn't give him the time of day but because the Burlings actually think that they have done something wrong and potentially might be arrested or there might be a scandal they're more willing to listen to him so that's kind of why he's used the inspector but it isn't the only kind of reason why he's a police inspector it isn't um, supposed to be a realistic account of a police inspector who's gone to a house it's more symbolic than that because of the ties to expressionist drama. Uh, so we're going to be looking at four different interpretations of Inspector Gould's character and what he might represent. So what I would like you to do is, um, in a second, just copy down the diagram onto your page, make it big. Often when I ask people to copy down diagrams, they make them teeny. You're going to be writing stuff in each of the sections. So if you have particularly large handwriting, make it a particularly large pie. If you've got teeny tiny handwriting, make it still quite large. So we're going to be looking at these four um, potential interpretations. Um, the first is that he could be a ghost um, or spiritual guide, that should say, sorry, um, because his name Ghoul, G-O-O-L-E, is a homophone of Ghoul, which means ghosts. Um, so he could be there to give the Burlings a second chance, similar to Jacob Marley, basically, um, in A Christmas Carol, the idea that a ghost can kind of visit these people and help them along onto their spiritual journey of realising how wrong they've been and how they should change their behaviour. 
Um, secondly, um, it could be that he is the voice of Priestley and who is airing his socialist views, so he represents socialism. Um, thirdly, it could be that he's God, so he appears to be omniscient, which means all-knowing, um, and this is typically a characteristic which we associate with God. Um, as much as you might consider yourself to be really brainy, you don't know everything. And if you consider what we're kind of trying to say when we say someone is omniscient, we literally mean they know everything. Um, and he appears to know how everyone was involved with Eva and like the dates and intimate details of that. So it could be that he represents that kind of religious influence as well. Um, this is my interpretation of him. Um, and I normally only share this with my own classes. So if I don't teach you, you're very privileged to hear this. Um, he represents the world wars. So, spoiler, he visits twice, is all I'm going to say. Um, and both times, there's a sharp ring. And so the first visit symbolises World War One when he, um, the world war kind of shook up society and changed things, but then things went back to how they were. And then the second sharp ring at the end, I think, symbolises World War Two, because they haven't learnt their lesson fully. That kind of thing. Um, so, as usual, we're going to watch a clip, but this clip is actually just literally the inspector's final speech, so it's only a couple of minutes long. And then we are going to annotate that part of the play. Even though it's a short section of the play, it is quite a long video of annotations because there's a lot to cover. Um, it's a key part of the play and it's really, really important that you understand this. So if there is anything at all which is mentioned either in this video or any of the other videos that are linked to this lesson, please do get in touch with your class teacher to ask for further clarification because we really want to make sure that you understand this because your understanding of the inspector's message basically sums up your understanding of the entire play. So we are going to consider a little bit more of the context um, in order to understand Priestley's message and what Inspector Gould represents, we need to understand the time and it was set in, but also the time that Priestley was writing in. So here we have a programme note. So if you've ever been to the theatre, you'll know that you can get a programme when you go and watch a play. And within this programme, there's normally kind of information about the actors and the directors and the play itself and why they're putting it on. And this was a note which was written by Priestley to accompany a production of the play which was performed in 1972. So this is years after it was first performed. So it was first performed in 1945. However, Priestley is still insisting on it being set in 1912. Um, and it might actually be worth you pausing the video to read the whole of this production note, but I'm only really going to be, um, going to be looking at certain sections of it. So we are going to be looking at the fact that it was written at the time of the Red Army. The Red Army were communists and communism is not the same as socialism. If you're not sure of the difference between them, then there's a separate context video um, to help sum them up for you. Um, but being a communist, they would be more kind of open to socialist ideas than a capitalist would, if that makes sense. Um, but he is talking about how popular it was in Soviet countries because they were particularly open to the idea of socialism and he says that the reaction of audiences was almost exactly the same even during the last 10 years I have had innumerable letters from graduates undergraduates high school students from everywhere demanding to know who or what the inspector was they're having been furious arguments about him oddly enough they have never asked about the second inspector who was on his way Though this is not simply a dramatic twist, that really, but really the key to the play. So Priestley here is telling the audience watching the play, bearing in mind you'd probably read the programme before you watch the play, that there's two inspectors, there isn't just one inspector, and that whilst the first inspector is on the stage for pretty much all of the play, um, and the second inspector doesn't even step foot on the, on the stage, that doesn't mean that the second inspector is not as important as the first inspector. Um, and he is saying that it's not simply a dramatic twist, but really the key to the play. So this is kind of um, 
kind of help our own interpretation of what the inspector could represent. If he's telling us that this second inspector is key to it, then it's not just a twist. It isn't kind of like a, God, they must be getting really bored watching the play by now. How can I make this more interesting? Um, and he says, if mermaid audiences do not relish the play, then I should be sorry, but I can hardly grumble because this is one play of our time that certainly has had its share of attention. Um, and then he says, the particular year in which the action is supposed to be happening was not chosen at random. It is significant and is indeed another key to the play. Now, if you're anything like me, you're going to be feeling a little bit like a detective at this point. He doesn't tell us why they're keys to the play. He just tells us that they are. Um, and I think the most important thing that we can take away from that is basically that my interpretation of what the inspector represents is correct and that he does represent the World Wars. Because you have World War I, which is very big, very impressive. We focus a lot on it. Um, it changed up society, big way. However, we did go back to having a rigid class structure and things weren't entirely moved on. And then things really did change after World War II because we became socialist, which in Priestley's mind is winning. Um, so bearing in mind that my interpretation has not come from nowhere, Priestley was um, involved in World War I. He was fighting. Um, and this is an excerpt from Priestley's memoir. So a memoir is kind of like a, like an autobiography, but you kind of focus on key parts. You don't, it's like your memories, I guess. Um, and so here he says, the British command specialised in throwing men away for nothing. The tradition of an officer class to find both imagination and common sense killed most of my friends. As surely as if those cavalry generals had come out of the chateau with polo mallets, so here he's talking, he's making an allusion to the idea that they are upper class and quite posh. Um, call this class prejudice if you like, so long as you remember that I went into that war without any such prejudice, free of any class feeling. No doubt I came out of it with a chip on my shoulder, a big, heavy chip, probably some friend's thigh bone. Um, and here, this is quite graphic description on, from Priestley about where his obsession with socialism comes from essentially um that he went into world war one and throughout this i've been talking about how class structures broke down during world war one and they did um world war one lasted four years though so you need to imagine that at the start of world war one you would have people who are upper class who would automatically just on the basis of them being upper class be given largely administrative roles within the fighting um, and the working class people, just on the basis of them being working class, would be the, the cannon fodder, is what they're called. Um, and they would be killed. A lot of them were killed. Um, and Priestley acknowledges this, that it killed most of his friends. Um, because you would be sent away in regiments to fight alongside people that you grew up with. Um, and Priestley would have watched several of his friends dying and would have come away from that war as he says with a big chip on his shoulder and that's kind of a metaphor if you have a chip on your shoulder it means that you have like a grudge you've got you're quite angry about something and Priestley came out of that war angry about the class divide the fact that because he was coming from a lower class meant that he saw lots of his friends dying whilst people coming from an upper class kind of had quite a cushy experience of the world war basically um and he used this, um, he used this grudge and he used this kind of um, want to change things about society to help him bring ad um, attention to social issues. So social issues which basically affected working class people. Um, so here he says there ought to be no more of these lunches and dinners at which political and financial and industrial gentlemen congratulate one another until there is something done about Rusty Lane and West Bromwich. While they exist in their present foul shape, it is idle to congratulate ourselves about anything. Um, and you can immediately hear kind of almost like tones of act one here, this idea of congratulating themselves and being pleased with themselves, that kind of um, just accepted that life was great for them and ignoring everything else. Uh, when he's talking about Rusty Lane and West Bromwich, um, he is 
referring to a part of Britain which, according to, I don't know, gossip, um, Queen Victoria ordered the blinds on her train to be pulled down as she went through this area because it was just so ugly and disgusting looking. Uh, because they were all incredibly poor there and it was an area of great social deprivation and he is talking about how it is wrong for rich people to kind of congratulate themselves on how well they're doing whilst their success is basically founded on the poverty that some people were having to live in um, and that you can't act like Queen Victoria and just pull your blind down and ignore that kind of impoverished existence whilst you're congratulating yourself. He says it's idle. Idle, if we think about um, laziness um, and also kind of connotations of just being so arrogant that you don't particularly want to even consider it. Um, that is what he's addressing, this kind of, that it's it's pointless and that they're wasting their time congratulating themselves whilst that situation still exists. And Priestley is very keen on drawing attention to that because poverty also existed after World War II. When the audience were watching the play, they would be familiar with images like this where you would be walking past buildings which had been bombed waiting for them to be rebuilt. Britain did not rebuild itself overnight. It was a long going kind of long process. Um, but one thing that did come about during World War Two was um, a document called the Beveridge Report. Um, and this was written in 1942. And Beveridge was basically an economist and an economist um, studies money. And this was an ongoing battle essentially to get rid of those areas of deep social deprivation um, and Beveridge wrote that Britain was being held back by five giants uh, and this is very similar to A Christmas Carol so he says the five giants that this is like what a hundred years later we're still looking at want so poverty ignorance do these sound familiar? So lack of education, disease, squalor, so that's lack of decent housing, it's also dirt, something squalor, it's not really dirty, um, and idleness, so lack of employment, but again this idea of being lazy and not being able to do anything. Um, Beveridge concluded that that was kind of what was holding back Britain, um, and that this Beveridge report was basically the catalyst for the formation of the NHS. So they st started about kind of thinking, well, how can they change Britain? Um, so in 1945, Britain elected its first Labour government. So we have Clement Attlee was our um, Labour Prime Minister. And it brought about several things which we still kind of use and appreciate today. So we have the creation of the welfare state and that was cradle to grave support. So cradle is what you're in when you're a baby. Grave is where you go when you die. Um, and what that basically meant was you have things like social workers. That was suddenly a thing that you would care about a baby. Um, and you might potentially intervene if a parent wasn't um, looking after their child well enough. But it was kind of expected of society to take care of that rather than just its parents and just like let the child be neglected. Similarly, you then had social workers looking after old people. Um, you had compulsory free secondary education for everyone, not just for rich people um, or boys. You had the nationalisation of key industries. Nationalisation basically meant that the government would fund it through taxes. And then if the company did particularly well and created a profit, then the profit would go into developing further services, which would form part of the welfare state. Um, you had the creation of the NHS. So the NHS started in 1947, but that was a very long ongoing process to get that <laughs> system in place. Um, and you had social housing. So that idea that if you were homeless, then you could apply to get somewhere to live. Um, so 
This brings us back to this idea of Inspector Gould being Priestley's mouthpiece and representing socialism. So you have here a quote um, from the guy who is considered to be the father of the British NHS. So he was the um, MP for for health for the Labour um, Party and he is kind of really strongly associated with socialism basically. Um, and a mouthpiece is somebody who speaks on behalf of somebody else. So instead of Priestley being on there just spouting his views, he could potentially be using Inspector Gould to represent socialism and everything that he says is then coming back to that socialist message, potentially. Um, in which case, then we need to also bear in mind what that second visit represents, because um, J.B. Priestley himself has pointed out that it's a key part to the plot. So if his first visit represents socialism, does his second visit represent socialism? It could do, but you would need to kind of think that through a little bit further, especially if you are aiming for the top, top marks. You need to think about what both visits would represent. Um, so by now, your pie chart should be pretty full. Um, hopefully, you will have been making notes about the context. Apologies, I should have been telling you to write that down. Um, but hopefully you will have used your brains and made notes as I was giving you gold. Um, if you didn't, I suggest you go back and just jot some stuff down because honestly, gold coming out of my mouth right now. Um, last activity for today is to answer this question. So how does Priestley present Inspector Ghoul? What I would like you to do for this is to decide what interpretation you think. he What, what does he represent? You can use any of the ones that I've given you or you can come up with your own interpretation. Uh, you do, however, need to be thinking it to how he's presented, so quotations which support your view and why Priestley would want him to represent whatever you've said. Um, you can use any of the interpretations that I've given you. It just needs to be whichever one you can explain best is the one that you choose and explain it in as much detail as possible. So write a really nice detailed response to this. Your teacher will be a bit more specific about how long your response should be. Um, but I personally feel like you could really actually go to town on this question and try to think of an interesting interpretation. Um, or you can borrow my, as I say, normally reserved just for the children that I teach, interpretation of him representing the world wars. Um, but yeah, another lesson done. Well done.